well. Okay, cool. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll just give everyone a second to come in. You're all coming in, so that's good. Um, let us know in the chat where you're from. I'm sure we've got lots of our regulars here. And uh, you'll notice that we're a little bit changed tonight with me welcoming you all because our lovely Kelly is on holiday. And uh, so we're wishing her a lovely time. And yeah, so down to me. So tell us where you're from. And as Kelly says, what have you had for your tea? <laughs> you don't say tea though, do you, Chris? I don't say tea. No, I've, I'll have dinner. <laughs> I'm from down south. What can I say? <laughs> Okay, we've got people waving at us, raising their hands. Hello. People raising their hands. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> We're up to nearly 230 people in. That's great. Hello to everyone. Oh, Shepherd's Pie. I'm trying Hi. to work out whether it's what people have had for their dinner or where they're from. Mm, Todd Morden. Oh, I know Todd Morden. Leeds and London. Leeds. And, and How do you pronounce uh, that? Todd Morden. I'd say Todd Morden. Do you? Oh. <laughs> It's <laughs> 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 Becky, I'd have been with you. Todd Morden. <laughs> Who knows? Know. Paisley, I used to live near there when oh, I was a kid. Next. Hello, yeah. Sue Smith from Dorset, my neck of the woods. Hey, there's Abbott from Cardiff. <laughs> <laughs> Is Abbott here? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I can't see the chat. But so it's I got to change your delight for dinner. I hope that's not all you've had, Sonia. Yeah. Oh, I love, <laughs> love butterscotch change of delight. Especially Whoa. frozen. Put it in, makes a lovely ice lolly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, a bit random. <laughs> <laughs> right then, what was it the other week? Cheesecake and custard. That was very random. Yeah, so, indeed. Indeed. Oh, vegan jambalaya. Donna kebab, sorry. Donna kebab. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Love that. <laughs> Hi from Weymouth. Oh, you're on your holidays. That's dedicated. Oh, in the Isle of Wight. Oh, have a good time then. Northampton chicken pie. Hello, me. Oh, that's my favourite. Oh. Aren't you? Oh, Aren't you? Very good. Oh, that sounds healthy. Cottage um, courgette and chard. Because mm, early, early. <laughs> Three hundred in the room now. I can see Omar sitting there, looking very busy, trying to let people in and deal with people's issues getting in. Yeah. So go in while the rest of uh, the rest of the people come in. Um, so obviously, as I've said, and you've noticed, we're we're rather thin on the ground today. We've got a few absentees for a variety of reasons um, and we've got quite a lot to get through tonight so we've decided to dispense with our traditional introductions because most of you have been before and you you know us all you know so um, as you can see there's just a few of us here tonight um, we have just a couple of things to let you know um, firstly in terms of resources that we send out after these webinars, <coughs> we've, um, we've had a few technical issues over the last couple of weeks. So we've taken the decision to put together a mailing list, um, which is based on everybody who's attended all the webinars. So if you've attended before, or if, even if this is your first time, um, you will go on our mailing list and then we will send out a weekly email, which has got the resources from the webinar um, for that week and it will also have the link to register for next week as well so um, that will come out to you sort of a day or so after the webinar so I know some of you email in and say oh can I have the link can I have the link if you've been to one it will come to you it will still go on all our social media as well because I know lots of you like to register that way um, and as well as that um, any um, any technical issues tonight? Um, Omar's asked if we could please put those into the Q and A. Um, with the, the chat being so busy, it's getting difficult to keep track of them all. So if they go in the Q and A, it's just easier for us to be able to manage them and sort them out as quickly as we can. Um, so that's that's the uh, that's the main other thing. Um, 
Kat will be here shortly and hopefully she will pick up um, the questions that are coming in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll monitor that for the time being. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. We have a very special guest with us tonight, which is um, Intrude. But I'm going to leave it to her to tell you a bit more about herself. Ready to go. Okay, well, hello. I don't think I've ever spoken to such a large audience before, so um, a little bit intimidating for me. But um, just as a little background of why I'm here and who I am. So I'm a social worker. I haven't turned up in the wrong place. Um, I've been qualified for 20 years exactly. I finished my social work course in 2000. I've worked in adult services mostly, but all sorts of adult services. So I've got experience working in older adults, older adults with mental health, uh, adults with physical disabilities, a little bit of time in adults with learning disabilities, um, and all sorts of mental health services. I've been an AMP, a uh, best interest assessor, um, a practice educator, and I'm currently working in the NHS in forensic services. And I am also doing a part-time professional doctorate in social work. So that's a bit about me. Okay, thank you. And uh, you also do some brilliant blogs, which we're going to send out links to tomorrow. Um, and I have learned such a lot from you over the years and especially around power and empowerment, which is why um, we asked you to be our guest speaker tonight. So tonight we're going to be looking at power and empowerment, the theory and the practice. And uh, you'll notice there is actually a question mark in the title here, power and empowerment question mark. And we're going to look at why that question mark exists um, as we run through. But for me, this is actually a really important topic. It follows on from a couple of weeks. You know, we're on our eighth webinar. It's hard to believe we're now on uh, week eight of this series of webinars. But the last couple of weeks, we've looked at some really important topics around anti-racist practice. And then last week, looking at Yusuf's care experience, um, his experience of receiving care and really important topics that really touched on aspects of power. And so I wanted us to look at power and empowerment. I know lots, I know our audience is very mixed. I know there's lots of students, there's lots of new social workers, but also lots of very experienced social workers also join us. But one of the things I feel quite strongly about as a practice educator, oh, I'm just thinking I didn't introduce myself, did I, if you haven't been before. So I'm Siobhan McLean and a social worker for 30 years and I'm also a practice educator. So as a practice educator for the last 25 years or so, one of the things I feel quite strongly about is that sometimes students will talk about the use of empowerment. And when you try and discuss that with them, they don't really know what they're meaning by that. I think sometimes it's a bit of a throwaway word that we use in social work. And I think we, we use it too much and we don't always understand how that fits into what we're doing. So I wanted us to really um, spend some time looking at power and empowerment. So um, we're going to use the magic roundabout as our theme, if you like, for tonight. And that's because Ermintrude writes under the pseudonym of Ermintrude. And if you're not familiar with the magic roundabout, which of course Omar isn't, um, uh, he's told us earlier, well, Ermintrude was a character in the magic roundabout but we're going to use the magic roundabout to think about power and empowerment i'm going to ask you at the end whether you're familiar with the magic roundabout or not the concept of a roundabout might be relevant for you so at the end we'll look at why the magic roundabout and how does that fit in but i know that you will uh, remember this from the very first and, and couple of first couple of sessions that we did on the webinar around looking at what's the difference between a theory, a model, a method, an approach and a perspective. And so I'm not going to go into this in detail here because you can watch back um, our early webinars if you didn't attend those. But what I am going to say is that I think people think of empowerment as a model in terms of it is about what we do in practice and the way that we act in our practice. But before we can 
think about models, we need to understand theory. So we're actually going to start this session off by looking at the theory of power. And what I really want you to do, it's not a single theory. There are a number of theories around power. And power, we need to think about how is power constructed? How is power built? And those little Lego bricks on there demonstrate the different, if you like, theories of power, and maybe some of the language that's used around the theory of power. What we really need to recognize in social work is that power is multidimensional. It's made up of lots of different components, but it's also very fluid. It has constant movement, much like a roundabout has constant movement. But I think power is definitely misunderstood in social work. So what I'm gonna do is we're going to look at these different Lego bricks of power. And we're gonna look at how power is constructed before Ermintrude shares with us her thoughts. So we're going to build up looking at power and then Ermintrude is going to step in the spotlight and then we're going to look at empowerment and why the question mark around empowerment. So let's look at, this is really in a way, how is power built? How is power constructed? And different writers will use different phrases and different theories will use different aspects of power. But you'll often read about things like French in 1985 started to talk about dimensions of power. Dominelli talks quite a lot about dimensions of power. So the dimensions of power are often seen as these power over. You'll see the bold here in each of the levels of dimensions. Power over is really about the power that can be held by a dominant group over another. Power of is about the collective strengths which people hold to make changes. So when people come together in a collective, that gives strength. It gives the strength, the power of a particular group, if you like. Power to refers to people's ability to make changes or to reach decisions. So someone might have the power to reach a decision or the power to make change in their life or in others' lives. Sometimes that's referred to as transformative power. But when we look at dimensions of power, it normally starts with the word power and then has a slightly different word after it. So power too, I think, sits better in the dimensions of power. We can also have power with. Power with is about people finding a common ground to build a collective strength. So having power with others. Creating power with requires us to acknowledge diversity and in actual fact to celebrate diversity I think and to also recognize disagreement whilst we actually seek to create a common ground about values and actions so we can create power with others and then power within for me is perhaps the most important dimension of power that I want to think about in relation to when we come to look at empowerment certainly but in terms of social work, power within is about the power that someone holds themselves, within themselves. So it relates to a person's sense of self, a person's self-worth, their knowledge about themselves, how they feel about themselves. Power within relies on people having an ability to imagine something different. And perhaps most importantly, to have hope. And I've talked a lot in these webinars about the importance of hope in social work. And you have talked very much last time about hope and that children are born simply with hope. Everyone has hope, but sometimes social workers take hope away from people. Spirituality, being able to reflect critically and creative arts can all help affirm power within. And I think that was very strongly, very clearly demonstrated uh, in last week's presentation by Yusuf. So that's dimensions of power. But then there's lots of different theories about power and it's really about how is power built? How is power constructed? And if you're thinking about power in perhaps your placement, I was talking to a student today in supervision about power and how power works. And we, I was thinking about all of these different theories of power and perhaps which one she might want to relate to her practice. But there's lots of different theories. Realms of power is, um, I think you would pronounce this Vanniklassen and Miller. 
they talk about gender in relation to power and they identified three realms of power. Lots of people talk about realms of power and in a way realms of power is almost about where power lies in some ways. You can have a public realm, a private realm and an intimate realm of power. The public realm of power is visible power. It's what we see, it's what's obvious, it's maybe what's overt, if you like. So in relation to gender, which this particular theory looked at, you could think about how men and women are treated differently in employment. So think about gender relations, that, that widely recognized gender pay gap. You could think about how the pandemic is impacting differently in terms of gender. The private realm of power is power which is expressed within people's private lives. So perhaps within family relationships, friendships, intimate relationships, that sort of thing. So we're looking here at whether this is institutional or individual in some ways, um, but then intimate realm of power, that's the bit that's closely linked to the concept of power within. It's about aspects of self-esteem, confidence, and a relationship to your own body, if you like, in terms of gender. So what you start to see here is realms and dimensions are actually, they start to overlap. That's why they connect through the Lego bricks. Every element of power, every theory around power connects really. It's just different ways, different theorists understand power and the dimensions and the way power is built in different ways. The writing of, of Joseph Nye, this is drawn out of politics which if you remember when we looked at what is critical reflection, we talked about that bringing in power dynamics, but also the political context of practice. So it can be useful to draw from politics aspects around power. And Joseph Nye talks about two types of power. He says there's hard power and there's soft power. Hard power is about how we maybe use inducements. It's a carrot or stick, kind of how do you get how do you use your power with a carrot or a stick? Soft power rests on the ability to shape the preferences of others. So it's really about leadership in some ways. Now, if you wanted to use this to think about politicians, for example, then we've referred, I think, early in the webinars to Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister in New Zealand, and she has very powerfully quoted that she leads with compassion and that she has been very criticized as how can you lead with compassion it's too soft but actually it's a soft power it's the use of a different type of power taking people with you rather than making people do something so again it's just different ways of looking at power the faces of power is another way of looking at power you can have the different faces some are visible sometimes power is hidden Sometimes there's invisible power. And all of this starts to connect. Do you remember we've talked a lot about connect? These, uh, this, the student group that we, we came together to create these webinars are called Social Work Student Connect. Connections matter to us in these webinars. And theory starts to connect and all of these different Lego bricks begin connecting. But the faces of power, are sometimes used to describe in theory and we could look at visible power which is the power that we see in structures and institutions you could look at hidden power which is really about what goes on behind the scenes what we don't really know about it's sort of the hidden agenda if you like that can be reflected in the way that powerful people maintain control because they influence what gets on the agenda and that's probably where we're going to end tonight. I want you to just think about that. How do people in power control what gets on the agenda, if you like? But then we've got invisible power. And this takes us back in a way to last week and the last couple of sessions that we've had. I want you to, to if you've been here the last few weeks, I want you to think about Diana's student spotlight in the anti-racist practice webinar. And I want you to think about Yusuf in last week's webinar invisible power is really the most insidious the most dangerous i think of the three faces of power it's really about the way that powerful groups can begin to influence the way that people think about themselves so this links back to power within because powerful groups start to shape people's beliefs and their own sense of self through processes of socialization and internalization 
and what is often referred to in theory as invisibilization. Invisibilization, I think, is really well described in this quotation, although it takes a bit of pronouncing when I get to the middle, so I'm hoping I'm going to get the word right. But invisible power is when those who have power to name and to socially construct reality, when those people choose not to see you or not to hear you, when someone with the authority of, say, a teacher, or we could put in there a social worker, describes the world and you're not in it, there's a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you were looking in the mirror and saw nothing. It takes some strength of soul and not just individual strength, but collective understanding to resist this void, this non-being into which you're thrust and to stand up demanding to be seen and to be heard. When this invisible power, this invisibilization of people, people don't see themselves. Remember when Diana was talking about how you don't see yourself in diversity in terms of who is teaching us in social work, who is there in leadership in social work, we need to be able to see ourselves. Remember Yusuf and this painting, not looking in the mirror and seeing himself, but looking in the mirror and seeing something else, someone else, that stripping of cultural identity. That's invisibilization. The way that people in power can get you to see yourself differently, change your self-esteem, change your self-worth. All of that is about the power people have over you, impacting on your power within. So it all starts to connect together and how power is constructed begins to connect as the Lego bricks connect. Spaces of power. We've talked a lot in the webinars about spaces. We've talked a lot about spaces of reflection, for example, but spaces of power, I think, is really interesting. And for me, is one of the things that I've been looking at a little bit during pandemic practice. So closed spaces, they're the spaces where decisions are made and they're closed off to people who aren't in certain groups. You can't go, there's a professionals meeting. A professionals meeting? So that meeting is about people, but those people can't go in it. That's a closed space. A closed space could be political, it could be managerial or linked to certain groups or professions. But closed spaces also operate in workplace cultures and social groups. You know, you can get what we might call a clique, a group of people that close off to others. Then we've got invited spaces. Now, in invited spaces, people might be invited to participate in these spaces. So you might have, for example, I don't know, a, some kind of um, meeting where a service user is involved or a ward round sometimes where people come into that. But the invitations to take part in those spaces are still controlled by the people with power to invite or exclude people. So there you have to be invited. You're not really you don't really have power because you've been either invited or not invited. But then you've got claimed spaces. Claimed spaces are where people claim the right to have their say, to be heard, to make a difference. Claimed spaces. You could use this if you're on placement now to think about spaces, to think about where are decisions being made and what is that space of power? Who is in, is it a closed space? Is it an invited space? Is it very rarely a claimed space? What's happening there? And I think this is really interesting, just about, you know, I've been talking to social workers doing quite a lot of reflective sessions with people during the pandemic. And a lot of people who've said to me, they've found, for example, court coming into their own homes because they've been giving evidence in court from their bedroom and how it feels different because a closed space or an invited space often has things that surround it that say there's power here about the way people dress or even what the room looks like. So thinking about all of that space of power is coming into people's homes now and how's that working? So all of these aspects of power connect together. But perhaps one of the most famous studies around sources of power is an old uh, study by French and Raven. 
Um, and I can't actually see on my screen what the date of that is because I can't see the whole screen, but you'll be able to see the date. It's, a, it's an old uh, reference, but it's seen as a very seminal piece of research now. French and Raven talked about different sources of power that professionals hold. So it's about where does our power come from? Now they talked about legitimate power or positional power. And that's the power that we have because of the way an organization is structured. So for example, a supervisor might hold legitimate or positional power because of their position as a supervisor, supervising others. Then there's expert power or professional power. Now this is where a particular person is seen as having a, a bank of knowledge or expertise. They're seen as an expert in a situation. Then you've got reward power, and that's power that is gained through the ability to give a reward of some kind. Now that could be, if you like, social workers can give rewards of all kinds. We may not see them as rewards, but what if you can decide whether someone is eligible for a service or not? What about whether you can say, okay, you don't need to be on a, um, a plan anymore? Those kinds of things, that's a reward potentially for somebody. Referent power, that's the power that's created by the admiration and respect that a person can have for somebody else. So it might be about an individual characteristic. Some people have charisma, or it could be based on an admiration that people have for people from a particular profession. One of the things I was talking about in supervision this morning with Lorna, a student I'm working with, was about how people have a lot of um, respect, if you like, for their GPs. They almost refer to the GP, it's that referent power. Some of that comes from legitimate or positional power as well, or expert power, but it's that power that can be created by looking up to somebody. Sometimes that comes from society. And then the other source of power that French and Raven talked about was coercive power. And that's the power that's based on the ability to apply a punishment or a sanction to somebody. And that's, that's often seen as the most obvious form of power. And it's perhaps the, the form of power where it's most likely to build um, defensiveness from people or perhaps resentment. Sometimes though, if you like, that's the power that's in your face, if you like, it's the obvious, very clear power. Sometimes that's the only power people see. So sometimes social workers feel like, well, I'm not applying a punishment or a sanction, therefore I'm not using power. That's nonsense. We are surrounded by power, but it's lots of different types and forms of power. Because I'm a practice educator, I'm very familiar with um, how the Inner London Probation Service did um, a document that was actually really helpful in the 90s for practice educators. It was looking at anti-oppressive practice in practice education, but they used French and Raven's sources of power, but they added a couple of others. And they talked about societal power, which is power that's based on, if you like, the ideology of superiority. So some people are oppressed and we know that and we've recognized that over the last few weeks and that's all about power and powerlessness. They also talked about resource power. Um, so you've all heard the phrase knowledge is power. Well, knowledge is a resource. It's a resource and we have resource power because we have knowledge about things. And then they added to it the power to determine. Now, because they were talking about practice education, they talked about how a practice educator has, if you like, the power to pass or fail a student. So they can say this student or they recommend a student has passed or failed a placement. But in many ways, the power to determine is really just about the power to make decisions which determine the impact, the outcome for other people. So social workers have power to determine all the times for, you know, when we make decisions about what action to take and so on. So we've got a whole range of different sources of power here that's recognized. So I'm going to just encourage you to think about the way in which all of those types and sources of power, I tend to talk mostly about sources of power because I think French and Raven's work brings all of those other theories around power together, if you like, but there's faces, there's dimensions, there's spaces, all the different types of power you want to think about. But power is very fluid. Very often, social workers feel very powerless in situations, but we have to be able to recognize power. We must recognize that we hold power in a whole range of different ways. 
And over the last few weeks, I've shared with you models of reflection that have been created by students and by newly qualified workers. And this one was created many years ago now, but it's one of my favorites. It's a brilliant model of critical reflection. Remember, critical means we bring in a consideration about power. And this was developed by a group of newly qualified social workers. And I don't know, I know lots of you are based in England, but many of you I know are from outside the UK. But in England, we have a city called Coventry, and this was developed in Coventry. And it's based around the Coventry Ring Road. So that's what you can actually see as the circle there is the Ring Road of Coventry, but it could just as well be a roundabout when we're talking about roundabouts tonight. But if you can look at that, if, I don't know if you can see it clearly enough, but up at the top of the Ring Road or the roundabout, if you like, there's an office. In the doorway of the office, there's a tiny little purple person. And to this group, that represented a newly qualified worker. Now, the size of the person represents the power that that person holds. And the size of this person's tiny, they, they feel very powerless in the organization. Further up that office building, people are looking out the window, they're bigger, they get bigger the higher up it goes. And that's about the hierarchy of an organization. What they were saying was, the people who hold the most power, the biggest people are actually very rarely leave the office, but they're higher up in the office. So that's what it represented. The person sets off on the ring road and stops at the first set of traffic lights. And there it says reflection for practice. That's the bit about reflecting before you go on a visit. You come down to the bottom of the ring road there and there's a house opposite the office. You can see the house. A home visit is represented there. There's another set of traffic lights and there they talked about the need to stop and reflect in practice. But if you look at the purple person now, you'll recognize that purple person has gone from being tiny to being bigger than the house. And what that really represents is that you might feel powerless in an organization. You might feel like all the decisions are made by people above you. But in respect of the service user, you are incredibly powerful. And to them, you're this big, huge purple person because you represent the organization and you carry with you all of that power into that person's home. And it's important to recognize that. You get back on the ring road and it's cut off because my photo skills aren't great, but there's another set of traffic lights and there they called that reflection after practice. Now they talked about changing power status and the size of the person. What's interesting is this represented the need for an ASYE year. And in the middle of the ring road, they put a park and I'll just finish off the story around the model. But they said in the park, there's a big tree here and it's the tree they called of knowledge and development. And they said, that's your team. And if you're in a good team, they kind of, they, they shelter you. You can sit as a new worker under the tree and reflect and all the branch, the tree branches out in different directions and you can learn from all the different practitioners. But they said not every team is like that. Some teams, the leaves are dropped on you and then the birds poo on you from above. There's no shelter. There's an owl sitting in the tree. That represents supervision. You want the owl to be your supervisor, your practice educator, your supervisor, because an owl can turn their head in 360 degrees and help you to look in things in a different way. They've also got, you can't quite read it, but on the grass, there's a sign and it says no ball games, no walking on the grass. And they said that represents organizational policy and procedure and what restricts you and what you want to do. And it adds to your sense of powerlessness in a situation. There's also a hedgehog there that is representing emotional intelligence because they said some team members are very prickly and you wouldn't ask them for help because they would prickle up. And finally, the little purple person isn't drowning in the pool, but they are learning to look at their reflection and develop their self-awareness. Because as we have already recognized earlier in the webinar, we need to have self-awareness to develop power within. So that's a good model of reflection, but that shows the fluid nature of power, how power changes. Maybe in the organization you feel powerless, but in relation to service users, you're very powerful. And there's a lot written by people with a lived experience who say the irony is that it's those people who hold the most power, social workers, who don't see their own sense of power. And I wonder if sometimes there's almost a view of power is something that we shouldn't hold, that we feel like we should be handing on to other people and therefore just, it's a dirty word almost. But actually, 
Owning your power is one of the best things that you can do as a social worker. So I'm gonna just give you a little tool here that can really help you to reflect on your own power. Take all of the theory of power we've looked at and whichever one you want to and just put together a few aspects of power. I've just drawn here from French and Rayburn and the Inner London Probation Service references earlier and I've come out with three, three types of power. Professional power, resource power, and the power to determine. I'm gonna look at flows of power and I'm gonna do this in relation to a student and a practice educator. Now, if you look at professional power, where does professional power lie? Really, professional power is lying with the practice educator because they're the one who's qualified, they're the one who is seen as the professional, Students may go out to see a service user or say, I want a proper social worker. Or I've known um, you know, other professionals phone up and say, I don't, we don't want to speak to a student, we want a proper social worker. I mean, it's an awful thing, but it's that power, that professional power lying with the practice educator. Resource power, especially at the moment with a lot of work going virtually, it's practice educators that can enable a student to access resources or its supervisors enable you to access learning opportunities that have that kind of ability to share resources with you. And the power to determine, to make a recommendation about a student lies with the practice educator. And as a practice educator, we need to recognize that that is the flow of power because a student is very unlikely to complain about a placement because they know about that power dynamic. We have to be able to recognize and own our own power. In doing that, that's the only way we can stop an abuse of power. When we don't recognize it, that's when a power can be abused. But what I want you to recognize now is, let's just change who we've got at the top. Let's turn the student to service user. Let's make the practice educator the student, the social worker. The flow of power is the same. Professional power lies with the social worker or student. Resource power, access to resources and to know what there is in the local area lies with the social worker or student. The power to determine action that's taken, perhaps at the end of an assessment, lies with the student. So a student can feel incredibly powerless in relation to their practice educator, in relation to a service user, they hold all the power. We have to recognize the flow of power. And this can be a really useful reflection for you to do perhaps as a student or even as a qualified worker to reflect on flow of power and use that to think about your CPD. Now, over the 30 years that I have been a social worker and a practice educator, I've really, I think, learned a lot about power and where power lies and how power is constructed. And at different times, I'm gonna use a different Lego brick to think about what's the power dynamic here, but I wanna look at power forms a huge wall. And sometimes it's a wall that it's really hard for us to get through, but we have to recognize which of those Lego bricks we hold because we hold a lot of power. And I've learned a great deal from the people around us. And I think, I feel quite strongly about that power with power with and we can all hold power with one another and we can all think about what we can do to make changes and I have learned a great deal as you all know I've told you how much I've learned from the group of students the social work uh, student connect team I've learned loads from them but over the years I have learned a huge amount from Ermintrude who introduced herself earlier but uh, I have read quite a lot of entries writing around power and empowerment and I think completely changed some elements of my own thinking on this and and I've learned such a lot from her if you don't follow her on Twitter then do because she is just fabulous uh, but I'm going to hand over to Ermintrude now who's going to share her own thoughts and reflections with us for 10-15 minutes around um, thinking about power. So uh, I can't see anything at the moment. I'm just sitting talking to a computer screen. That's how it feels when we're doing these webinars. But I'm thinking, are you still there, Ermintrude? Can you pick up? I am, and I, and I hope you can hear me. And just so people know, I don't have a photo. It's because I'm choosing to remain anonymous. But if you just imagine a pink spotty cow, that will probably do just as well as a photo, I think. Um, I did introduce myself briefly. There's obviously a bit of my background on the screen there. Um, one thing I didn't mention though, when I did introduce myself, is that I've also been a foster carer. So as well as 
being a social worker and having been a social worker now for 20 years, I currently am, um, I've also been a foster carer and that was while I was a social worker. So it wasn't before I was a social worker. And I will relate to that briefly. And I think what I just want to say as well, when I start talking about social work and power and empowerment, because I don't think you can talk about empowerment without talking about power, is that this perspective that I have comes very much from my practice. The things that I'm talking about and where I am now, that's not where I was when I qualified. And I think it's really useful just to bear in mind that this has come from my experience over the years. So it's not something that, and I wasn't wrong 20 years ago when I came out of my training. It's just a lot of my views have been trained, have been toned very much by my experience. And just going back to my experience as a student, when I went into social work, I was a care worker before I uh, did my social work training. And so I really didn't actually know particularly well what social work workers did, I have to say. And my first placement was in a statutory older adults team. And I felt completely clueless. And I was also having a few problems with one of my tutors at the university. And I just felt like I was struggling such a lot in that beginning. And I remember my practice teacher at the time, they were called practice teachers, not practice educators. So excuse my language a bit. Um, at that time, and she was amazing. And she said to me, hold on to the powerlessness that you feel at the moment. Hold on to that all the way through your career because you feel it now. But just as Siobhan mentioned, when you go into somebody's house, you have enormous power. You have enormous power when you visit in another person's home, when you phone them. And, and I call it, I know Siobhan's got the great um, theory behind it. I sometimes call it lanyard power. It's that professional power. She said, never forget that. And that has stuck with me all the way through over the decades that I've worked. And it's scary when I think about decades, that however powerless I feel, whatever, however powerless I feel, the person on the other side will always be much more aware of my power. And I'm going to relate one of the most, I think it's one of the, it's, it's, a, seri it's a situation that, that I was involved in. It was an assessment I did as an AMP, a Mental Health Act assessment. And it's one of the ones where I felt the power I had was the most obvious and prominent. And there's always going to be power in mental health act assessments. It's what happens during them. And as you train to be an AMP, if you do, you talk a lot about power. And in this situation, I had to go and assess a woman. She was in a, an A&E. She was in a place of safety. Um, and she was a devout Christian scientist. I didn't know much about Christian science. I still can't say I do. But the key aspect about this was that her religion meant that medical treatment was not permitted and that one healed with prayer. There is a bit more subtlety to that, but that's, that's the, the basic key point. Um, she'd been in, in the hospital waiting for the assessment for a number of hours. It didn't take long for me with the doctors to establish that she was suffering enormously and that she needed to be in hospital in our view. But this was against her religious beliefs. And she told us if she went to hospital, she would be ostracized by her faith, by her faith community, and that this would destroy her. And we took her to hospital. And I sat with her in the ambulance and I will never forget the screams that I heard in that ambulance. And it, it dwells on my mind and even now, as I'm thinking about it, I'm kind of shaking a little bit because while we took her freedom and that is a part of the process of mental health assessments and you're doing it for people, you hope, but this felt it was an active assault on her faith and on her community and such a powerful part of her being that we were removing from her. And when I think about empowerment and social work, sometimes I, I come back to that feeling of how that felt. I still think and I do think about it that it, I took the action that I should have taken at that time in the role that I had. But then 
I wonder, am I justifying that to myself? And how can I go home and think my role is about empowering people, knowing that those are some of the decisions that we have to make. And I'm just, I know Siobhan's talked a lot about theory and a lot more, you know, coherent than I can, but I just want to touch on one element around a book that I read. It was actually written 40 years ago and it's called, I'm just looking at it actually as I'm talking, Street Level Bureaucracy, um, Lipsky, it's a US text. And it relates in some of these decisions that we make. So that decision I made about mental health assessment, that was a big decision, a life changing decision. But some of the decisions we make are very small and we can still have an enormous amount of power in them. And this is one of the things Lipsky talks about. So he might talk about, it's not just about social work. He relates it about teaching, about um, working in local authorities, about police. That when I go into work in the morning um, and I decide what's my priority for the day and I'm using power when I do that by choosing who I'm going to phone first in the morning, I'm using my power. And I might not recognize it, but I, if I don't think about that, I can't counter it. And I think, need to think about why I'm making those decisions. Is there somebody that I prefer? Is there a family I like better? If I'm aware of it, I can reflect on it. And sometimes that power can be used to advocate. But just another thing I just wanted to reflect on in, in a sense was about an experience that I had as a foster carer. So this was a social worker I had who had assessed myself and my partner and we'd been approved to foster and we were waiting and I can't quite remember if this was when she was coming to talk to us about a first placement or it was after the approval had happened and she came round to our house and I can't quite remember the context but she said and she knew I was a social worker obviously because when you're going through the assessment you know everything about people's lives and and we talked about it sometimes and she said to me oh you know um we couldn't allocate you you know you're on the waiting list to be allocated but as as you know I'm still going to work with you because I know you but it's just temporary you know until we find someone to do it and I thought you know just by telling me that it's really disempowering me it's making me think you know we're on the kind of second list pile now as a social worker I know how it works and I know that, that sometimes you just don't have enough time to allocate people but hearing that you're not being allocated or you know somebody doesn't really want to work with you it, it, it shifted that a little bit I did actually tell her that but that and, and that, that's another story but it was just about thinking all these actions all these conversations that we have the language we use um, is all a reflection of our power and I'm just going to move on to empowerment because I think they follow each other and often when we think about empowerment the word is phrased as very much as a positive you know we'll empower people we'll share we'll involve I'll, I'll be different I'll be different when I practice and we have to acknowledge you can't think about empowerment without thinking about power very much and even when as I was saying even when we're not waving our lanyards around and forcing people to do what we think they should be doing we've still got that power and and there's lots of writing now and I'm, I'm sure we'll think about it a little bit more about increasing skepticism with the context of empowerment and I've, I've written about it myself and when we think in order to un empower someone, you need specialist social work intervention, is that statement in itself disempowering the groups and communities and individuals we might want to empower? Are we using the language of empowerment and self-empowerment and we're owning it as professionals? And it can't just be a word we throw around when we want to feel good about doing something. I think for me, empowerment really has to have a meaning. And I know this is something, again, that's just been reflected on a bit, but I, I just wanted to capture about this feeling. And I, and I mentioned it at the beginning when I was talking about um, my experience in placement, that this power and powerlessness can very much exist in the same person. I mean, they exist in me all the time. We feel powerful in some aspects of our life and powerless in other aspects of our lives. But so it is with the people we work with. And we may not have the gift 
to transfer that power. You know, we have to acknowledge and accept the power that we have, and we need to be honest about it. And when we talk about empowerment, we need to be sure that it isn't for us. It's not a professional empowerment. Um, saying that, on the other hand, I do think as well, we need to think about the power with the people that we work with. The powerlessness might be in the relationships with social work and with social services, but there may be enormous power and strength in other areas. And I think that's where the, and the strengths based social work models come in, actually, and all these things are linked together. Are we only recognising traditional power? How do we shape what empowerment means? And, and what can empowerment look like? I mean, there's an argument, and, I, and I'm very uh, sympathetic to it, that we can't empower others until we empower ourselves. And we can involve people, we can, under, we can involve people certainly in the jargon and the language we use, because that can often be very disempowering. But really, perhaps the only empowerment we can enable is self-empowerment. We need to be aware of power. But for empowerment, we need to be, it needs to be about shifting power bases. And we can't always do that. It's not always in our, in our gift. And we can also consider why do we need to empower somebody? Because the concept of empowerment could be said to have developed from structural inequalities. So the inequalities are there in order for us to need to empower people. And then are we colluding with those oppressions by coming from an empowerment perspective? And there's a, there's a quote that is from a book. I'll, I'll share the details of the book later, so don't feel you have to write it down. It's called Empowerment, A Critique, and it's Kenneth McLaughlin. And I love this quote, and it's, the need to empower springs from those who may have experienced oppression and spreading empowerment around like confetti may reinforce these inequalities. So what can we do if we're, if we're too troubled by empowerment, you know, where do we go? And, and, I, and I think, I'm not saying we can't do this, I'm saying we need to think about this. Personally, I think, thinking around co-production is a way to think around empowerment. It's not, we can't shift the power, but we can work together. And, and I think that's where I'm going to stop. And I'm sure we'll be able to talk more, but I'll share the names of the books in the chat. Sorry, I was on mute then and I was chatting away and no one could hear me. Thank you very much for sharing that, Ermintrude. That was, um, I always learn such a lot from you and it always takes me to a reflective space, I think, when I'm either reading things from you or, or listening to you. Um, and, and something struck me that I, I would like to share with people is when you were talking about language and language being about, about power, one of the things that it made, it took me to was... Um, some, something where someone didn't use jargon. They, it, I don't think you could have claimed this as jargon, but um, my mum had a need for some uh, social work support a couple of years ago. So it was basically coming out of hospital. It was a complex hospital discharge that was going on. And I have to say the social worker I thought was brilliant. I thought that the support that she provided and the package and everything was really good. But there was one thing that I found incredibly disempowering. And I never actually told her this because I felt like, oh, I shouldn't really say anything because she's been really good. But I'm an only child. And when I was speaking to a, 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 the social worker on the phone, she just said to me, mum thinks this should happen. And I remember feeling a, like a sharp intake of breath when she said, mum thinks this should happen. Because I thought no one else has ever called my mum, mum to me, because I'm an only child. I don't have a, you know, a sister or a brother who says mum this. And, and so no one else had ever said mum. And I was just, I felt like, are you trying to own my mum? This is my mum. She's my mum. She's not your mum. And I felt really kind of quite disempowered by that. And it's not jargon. It's just something that is, you know, it's not, she, she never said your mum and she never said my mum's name. She just said mum thinks this. And it just took away a whole sense of power, really. So sometimes even words that are not jargon 
it can be very disempowering for people because it made me feel like you're, you know, I'm as important as you are because she's my mum as well. It just felt wrong. It felt inappropriate. So just all kinds of things when you're on the other side feel very disempowering. So, um, and I always, I, I just always am taken to a new place of learning when I listen to you. So thank you for sharing that. So why the question mark around empowerment at the beginning? I said, we're going to look at theories around power, but then that takes us into empowerment. And I think Ermintrude has beautifully taken us from thinking about power into empowerment. And I think there's a question mark for me because the question is, can we actually empower people? We talk about empowerment and especially students talk to me a lot about, I, I was trying to empower the person or I read it a lot in assignments. But actually, can we really empower? Is it in our gift? You know, in, in many ways, I don't feel it is our gift to give. It is about enabling someone to empower themselves or creating a space that is um, a space where someone can empower themselves. Or maybe, I don't know, but I think there's such a misunderstanding of power in social work. And I think of some of the things that Ermintrude was saying really is that power is viewed in the same way for everyone. Power is often in social work viewed as wholly negative and then we, we feel like we shouldn't hold power. And power can be viewed as a commodity and for all of those reasons I think I have empowerment as a bit of a question mark. Is it actually something we can do as social workers? Maybe empowerment is something that's aspirational rather than achievable or maybe empowerment is something we shouldn't even aspire towards because maybe empowerment is about individualizing things and and further oppressing people by almost saying you need me to come and give you the gift of power almost oppressing the person further and yet empowerment sits right in the middle of the international definition of social work it says that what we do is the empowerment of people. It's part of the international definition of social work. So it leaves me sometimes reflecting on, am I out of line here? But if you read around empowerment, a lot of the kind of traditional stuff that I think is still being taught about empowerment is, it's very traditional, it's very sort of in, in many ways, a lot of the writing about empowerment that sees it as something that can be achieved and can be done seems to be quite old now. Traditionally, empowerment is seen as being about, you need to understand how power is constructed. It's seen as being about encouraging hope and hopefulness in people, developing positive attitudes and positive practice. So not being a cynical practitioner, as often cynical practitioners don't have hope, don't feel change is, a, is possible, those kinds of things. It's seen as being about seeing people as the expert in their own life, not coming at something as though we as the professional are the expert, but that the person is the expert and their family is the expert. Listening to people and really hearing them is seen as a key aspect of empowerment. Facilitating active and meaningful involvement so that people become fully involved in co-production. Acknowledging the dignity of risk and helping people to manage risk in a proactive way. Addressing inequality. All of these things are traditionally what empowerment is about. Recognizing power differentials. Owning the power that we have and using it responsibly. Rejecting the idea that problems arise out of a personal inadequacy or an impairment and instead viewing problems as the way in which we grow and develop and learn rather than seeing problems as an insurmountable difficulty. Empowerment is about challenging service-led paternalistic approaches to practice. It's about connecting with other people to achieve collective change. It's about drawing on people's strengths. It's about enabling and facilitating learning. All of these things are what empowerment is about. I suppose the question I have is, as social workers, can we really do that? As statutory social workers, can we really do that? Or do we hope that we do that? If we pretend that we do that, that's dangerous. Let's just be honest about what it is that we're doing and what it is that we are able to do. One of the, the writers that I find really helpful when I'm exploring power is Fook. I think Jan Fook's work is really helpful when thinking about power. And she talks about what she refers to, 
she does use quite a lot of academic jargon, but what she refers to is binary oppositional relations. And that basically means that we see things as either one thing or the other, almost as though they are opposing each other. So down there, I've got a seesaw. It's like it's either one or the other. So we tend to see people as either powerful or powerless. And as Irving Trude says, we can all be both powerful and powerless in different situations at the same time or whatever. Power held by social workers is seen as being either good or bad, but actually it can be both. People are seen as needing either care or control, and we have that as a whole debate in social work, the care control debate. But actually, maybe sometimes we need to do some elements of both. Expertise is often seen as lying with either the practitioner or the service user, but actually maybe expertise lies with both. So these binary oppositional relations are quite unhelpful because what we can do is if we see power in that way, it's actually a very simplistic way of seeing power. And then we can see it as, okay, I can give this over. I can hand over. It becomes a gift to give. Whereas actually it isn't a gift to give. What we need to do is maybe harmonize those either ors rather than seeing them as incompatible opposites, try and look at how we see power, where we stand in how we understand power, and see if we can harmonize these potentially opposing views and bring, if you like, the scales or the seesaw into balance. And then we can work in an empowering way. So we need to see people as both powerful and powerless. We need to recognize that power can be both positive and negative. It's the way that power is used that makes it either good or bad. In some situations, we need a balance of both care and control. Service users are experts on their own life and their own situation, but professionals have expertise on how to find solutions or how to navigate services or how different things connect together. Service users may not have that. So we have different types of expertise. So we don't need to see things as binary opposites. We don't need to see things as either or, but we can bring things more into harmony. And that may be more what empowerment is about. And I'm not saying that empowerment is about something. I'm saying I am still learning and I am still struggling with this concept around whether we can empower or whether we actually often disempower people. But one thing I do know is empowerment is not a magic wand. I love the quote that Ermintrude used about power isn't about throwing it around like confetti. You know, empowerment is not just a magic wand. And it's not something, I remember a conversation with a student a number of years ago now where I said to her, what, what models, what theories are you using there? She said, oh, definitely empowerment. So I said, okay, that's great. Tell me how, tell me what that means to you. How are you empowering this person? And she said, well, I got her to make the phone call for herself. Is that empowerment or is that just kind of handing over to somebody? Is What do we do about, or I think she actually said, I made her make the phone call herself. And I remember thinking, well, that's as far from empowerment as you can possibly get. Is this bit about what is it? It's not some kind of magic wand. Let's demonstrate a bit more sophisticated understanding here about power and empowerment. And this is one of my favorite quotes, actually, I use all the time in thinking about assessment and thinking about how we work with service users. And for me, this illustrates how every day in our practice, we disempower people, even with the best of intentions, we disempower people. So Seabury, Seabury and Garvin say, the only power base that a client brings into the relationship is informational. So the service user holds information, don't they, about their story, about their own story. They have control over the information, much of the information that makes up his or her situation. But that power base is weakened when a worker enters the situation after consulting with significant others who already know the client. What we do before we even go and see someone is we ask people about that person, we read about that person, we do all of that stuff before we even see the individual. We take away their power, the power of their story. And I think Yusuf really illustrated that very well in what he was talking about last week. So think about how, how are you disempowering people as well as how are you empowering people? Let's get the balance here. Let's think about this effectively. 
And for me, as I said, I think I'm making very slow progress here in my own career, you know, 30 years of social worker, and I'm constantly changing, I think, the way that I see power and empowerment. It's almost like the magic roundabout and the way in which the carousel horses go up and down, the way I'm changing my view. There's Brian, the snail from the magic roundabout, and it's a bit, it is slow progress for me, that whole move towards things. But what I've really liked over the last few years is rather than talking myself in my own practice about empowerment, I try and talk now about working in a power sensitive way so that I have a power sensitive approach to practice. And it's a phrase that I first saw being used by Ali Gardner in her work on personalization. And I really like Ali Gardner's work around personalization and social pedagogy. And maybe that's why I'm drawn towards it. But, but to me, what power sensitive practice means to me, I mean, this is a phrase that I saw used by Ali Gardner, but in terms of what I think it means to me, then it's all about the spelling of power. So understanding power, but to me, that word power, it spells out, it's about working with people and really seeing the person as a person. This person is not a problem, they're not a number, they're not a case file, they're a person. And when you work with someone as a person, as a whole person, that is being power sensitive. Understanding the power that we hold because it spells out the word power. It's about being open with people about what we can and can't do. But it's also about being open with ourselves about what we're doing and what we're achieving. It's about the word with. I like the whole idea of power with people. You know, we talked in the anti-racist practice webinar about how we can work together and, and um, white allies and Black Lives Matter with. When we're together with people, that's, I think, one of the best ways of working with people and being empowering, I suppose, in a way. It's all about, to me, it's about equality and promoting equality, recognizing diversity. It's not about treating people the same. It's about as far away from that as you can get, but it's about equality and recognizing diversity and responding effectively to diversity. And it's also, in many ways, about a return to radical practice in social work and what radical work really means. And so I, I can never pronounce this, it's terrible, but I never pronounce the, the name of the next writer or the writer that I'm gonna quote properly and I, I have some kind of block around this I don't know but this is there's a picture that you're all going to be really familiar with at the moment let's wash our hands let's wash our hands a lot but that aspect of being radical around our understanding of, of power comes from Freire, Freire I don't know how to pronounce it never do but washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful it's not it being neutral if we don't look at the conflict between powerful groups and powerlessness we're siding with the powerful and that's really important for us to begin to recognize this is about taking some kind of radical action trying to look at change trying to look at what can we do to change things and every single one of us as an individual can do something to change things and if you remember back to where we ended our webinar last week with Yusuf's call instead of making a difference, being the difference. Because Lum recognizes that whilst empowerment requires social transformation on a massive scale, and I think that's my issue around why I feel like as individual social workers, can we be really empowering? Or is this something about needing to have massive change on a transform transformative scale, really, on a macro level? But it has to begin with every individual having a personal commitment to empowerment and to making a difference. That's what Lum says. But remember last week we said, let's forget making a difference and let's be the difference. And every single one of us can be the difference, but we be the difference by understanding power and taking a deeper, more in-depth reflection about power and our use of power as social workers and as students. So I think as a result of tonight's webinar, the key thing that I want you to do is think about power and how power is used in social work. 
So just to let you know about our upcoming sessions, what we have uh, coming up is next week, and I want you to do something in preparation for next week. Next week, if you're coming along, we've got special guest Mark Dole, who is going to talk to us about social work in objects. He has a fabulous project that looks at what object represents social work to you. And I know that we've got many people who come back week after week on a Wednesday night. I'm going to ask you to think between now and next week, what object represents social work to you and why? And if you have that object and you can bring that object with you, then we might try like we did last week to switch cameras on at the end and have people showing their objects. Um, so it's a bit of an experiment because this has been something that's been going on all over the world, this objects project, and we're going to add to that in the webinar next week. And it's a really useful reflective session um, that we're going to have. Uh, with uh, Mark Dole next week and then we're going to go back to looking at aspects of models of reflection and we also have assessment coming up in practice looking at virtual assessment so um, I think in the chat box now I think the team are going to put the link to register for next week's webinar but as Chris said at the beginning we will be sending out to people an, an email each week we'll send out an email hopefully tomorrow maybe friday with all the link to ermin trude's blogs and the book that ermin trude referred to and um also to help you to register for next week but we started off so that's about upcoming sessions but to conclude our session for tonight we started off by saying that we were using the magic roundabout tonight to think about empowerment and i'm going to conclude with the Magic Roundabout. We partly used it because of our very special guest, Ermintrude, who I'm going to uh, um, enable to have the final word tonight. To, so just so that you can be ready to sort of conclude your uh, bit, Ermintrude, just to say, uh, I want you to have that final word. But um, in terms of the Magic Roundabout, what does the Magic Roundabout have to link to power? And um, because many of you may not have seen the Magic Roundabout, may not have been something that uh, you uh, were conscious of when, but it, it's a program that I used to watch when I was a child and it was always on just before the news actually. And that links us into why this is so relevant for power and empowerment. Um, it's interesting because it started off, uh, it was a French television program and French, uh, ironically is one of the leading writers in terms of or was one of the leading writers in terms of looking at theories of power so it was a French program and the characters when they were first written about represented politicians so much so that you may know about uh, Dougal was one of the key characters and that was actually referenced to Charles de Gaulle de Gaulle Dougal so they represented politicians and it was a very critical program they used to criticize politicians in some of the quotes they used and it was a program that could be seen and constructed with many different layers so it was a critical program it took a critical stance could be seen on many different layers so children could watch it and not know what it was saying about politicians and adults could watch it and recognize what it was saying about politicians so in one of the oh there's your uh, references that will come round to you as well on the email tomorrow but one uh, of the episodes of the Magic Roundabout that we are going to uh, conclude with, I think was called a, a Peaceful Day. It was called A Peaceful Day. And uh, Zebedee had a catchphrase, time for bed. So every program used to end with Zebedee saying time for bed. And at the end of the Peaceful Day, which is one of the famous episodes that was very critical of politicians, Ermintrude said, already, she asked the question. So Zebedee said, time for bed. Ermintrude said, already. And Zebedee replied, well, it's nearly time for the news and you've had enough magic for one day. One of the key things about critical stance is understanding how powerful groups set and form the agenda. You think about what the news says and it's powerful people that decide what goes onto the news, what's said about social workers, about society, if you like, and that is a critical stance. So we are going to end with Zebedee saying time for bed, Ermintrude asking what already, but we're going to hand over to Ermintrude for the final words. I'm going to say thank you and good night from me. I'm going to hand over to Ermintrude 
to uh, conclude our session as our special guest speaker tonight. So thank you for coming, Gomen Is there anything you want to say to finish things off tonight? Yeah, I'll just go. I just want to go back to where I started um, and saying that my thoughts about power and empowerment, they've come and they're developed over 20 plus years. This isn't easy. And I've not finished. And I've got another 20 years of learning about power and empowerment. So I think it's just useful to think about them. Don't think there's an answer because there isn't. And my my opinion will have changed in a year's time. And it's just keep them in mind and keep that relationship between them in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. It is constantly changing. So thanks, everybody. Hopefully see you next week. Good night. <laughs>